this is a Black Dower Network discussion on how the Afrocentrists in the Black conscious community were duped into opposing Islam by the white power structure. Leading this discussion is your brother Hakeem Muhammad, as well as our brother Sharif Muhammad, who is a scholar in the field. The brother teaches, is taught at Georgia State University in the area of history, and he is also taught Islamic studies. So listen up. That and, and like we have to acknowledge the role that white orientalists have played in this confusion that uh, many Afrocentrists have about Islam. And I'll go as far as to say in, is that many Afrocentrists have been duped by the white supremacist power structure and their anti-Islam uh, stance because a lot of like even parts of like Chancellor Williams' uh, works is that he's repeating, regurgitating. Uh, you know, white orientalists and, and portraying Arabs as well as Muslims and uh, no differently than many uh, white orientalists and this idea that Islam spread by the sword, you know, violently imposing itself upon uh, people that in and of itself is coming, is coming from this white orientalist idea that Afrocentrists have, whether knowingly or unknowingly, inherited. Um, and... I think Afrocentrism in and of itself, that anti-Islam manifestations of Afrocentrism is in and of itself insufficiently Afrocentric because many of them, like, they they primarily focus on, you know, ancient Kemet, and then they homogenize the theology of Kemet upon all of Africa, and then they just gloss over indigenous African civilizations, and they say all these civilizations were imposed by the Arabs or the Arabs were imposing the civilization, taking credit away from, you know, the Africans who actually established it. So I think the entire uh, narrative of anti-Islamic manifestations of Afrocentrism in and of itself is insufficiently Afrocentric. Yeah. Uh, is one of the great ironies uh, of Afrocentrism. Um I mean, it was, an, it, w- it was inevitable that Afrocentrist historians in the mid-1900s, though claiming to correct Eurocentric narratives about the world, would encounter, would encounter Orientalist writings and lean on them uncritically without taking into account how the power struggle between the Muslim world and Europe colored these writings. Now, you know, what are some of the ways, first of all, let's let's, uh, backtrack. Orientalism, for those listening and have never heard of this word before, is is the representation of Asia and the Middle East in a stereotypical way that embodies the colonialist attitude. It was a field that has uh, an artistic side to it in terms of um, paintings, but it also was a field that was dedicated to studying Asia, in particular Arabs and Islam. And it appeared around the late 1700s on through to the 1800s. And it is an outgrowth of the East India Company, which was this joint stock company, right? A joint stock company is the, was the first example of a modern corporation this joint stock company, East India Company, was the first, uh, sort of the first corporation in the world and the first European intrusion on the sovereignty of the so-called Middle East. And it set the ground for the British colonization of India. And so the first Orientalist scholars were British officials of this company. And while they asserted that they intended to study the culture and religions and languages of the region objectively, the reality is that their scholarship was always having a, had a political agenda. And it was written, they wrote on these subjects in such a way that supported their subjugation later on, portraying them as inferior, as in need of uh, being reconciled with the progress that is happening in the world, i.e. British values, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, and and, and their their opposition or their their gripe with Islam uh, would necessarily, 
uh, be reflected in their writings because the major obstacle to the objectives of Britain in India was the Mughal Empire, which was the last Muslim dynasty of India. And as the Mughal Empire declined, the East India Company, i.e. Britain, became more aggressive and influential over the region. So, you know, and, and let's not forget that, you know, the age of exploration was in part the desire to regain Asian territories that were lost with the expansion of Islam and access to new territories like West African gold, which belonged to the Muslim realm of Mali and Songhai. So from the beginning, there were political motives in this scholarship. And you can read people like Gramsci and Foucault who theorized the relationship between knowledge and power and how it's exhibited in the way in which language is used, even by the marginalized who are challenging the power structure, they often reinforce the basic logic of the power system in which everyone is functioning. And this is the case with Afrocentrism, that uh, it was inevitable that Afrocentrists would come to rely on these writings. Um, and in doing so, they would end up reflecting some of, they would end up reflecting the uh, colonialist uh, mentality towards Islam that they claim to, are tr to be trying to reject and undermine with regarding Africa. So what are some of the ways that Orientalism functions with a Eurocentric logic? I, I would identify three ways that, Orient that Afrocentrism functions with a Eurocentric logic, okay? Uh, briefly, the first is the belief that sophisticated architecture and literacy, what I call temples and tablets, are the only markers of civilization. And so this has caused them to have a tunnel vision that focuses exclusively on Egypt and ignores the rest of Africa's genius, as you pointed out. I mean, how many people know that... Uh, the the man who the European who's credited with the uh, the computer age that he was inspired his binary code of zero was inspired by the divination scale of the Congo right uh, that African fractals helped influence the way in which uh, the technological age uh, would sort of model itself. But everybody's so focused on Egypt, right? Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful um, uh, lecture given by a mathematician, Dr. Englosh, E-N-G-L, I think, O-S-H, either O-S-H or A-S-H, where he's talking about the African origin, the modern African origin of the computer age. So, but no one knows this because everybody's so focused on Egypt, okay? Secondly, Afrocentrists um, contrast religion with spirituality. You know what I'm talking about? I'm, is that I'm not religious, I'm spiritual? Exactly. Exactly. You hear this a lot. And what they're saying, is, what, what they're alleging is that African Ancient Africans dealt with spirituality, and outsiders, Arabs and Europeans, introduced something called religion. This would be a very strange thing to say to our ancestors, you know, several centuries ago, who would have no idea, A, what you're talking about, and B, what this has to do with anything, right? Afrocentrists, do not, do not even have a working definition of the word religion, first of all, which we can make sense of how they're applying it. Uh, but if we take the word religion to generally refer to a system of rites, rituals, taboos, doctrine, cosmology, and sacrifices that all reinforce an idea about the spiritual aspect of existence, then the historical reality is that Africans have always practiced spirituality in connection with the aforementioned, that religion was the conveyor of spirituality and its purpose was to reinforce one's relationship with the tribe, the land of the tribe, and the spirit world. 
And so this mantra we often hear, I'm spiritual, not religious, is not an African concept at all, but it has its origin in the, what we call the theosophical movement of Helena Blavatsky, who was a Russian occultist. Uh, and this whole movement known as spiritualism. All of this started when people who worked with the East India Company began translating religious texts from Sanskrit in India into European languages. And that sparked an interest in spiritual concepts outside of Christianity. This, of course, took them into ancient Egypt. Um, They became very obsessed with the idea of magic and having power over the material world. Um, And so the the occultism of Aleister Crowley uh, was a result of these efforts. So theosophy, um, theology and philosophy, concentrates on, which concentrates on the esoteric concepts of world religions, states, or Helena, uh, Helena Blavatsky states that the goal is to replace these world religions with this spiritualist point of view. So the dichotomy of religion versus spirituality is a purely Orientalist and modern concept. It's not ancient African at all. And yet it's something that Afrocentrists have assimilated into their sort of talking point. Now, the third and last thing, uh, which is how Afrocentrism functions with a European logic, and this is what is most problematic about the conscious enterprise and is the subject of what, you know, we've been talking about here today is their ideas on Islam, right? I mean, Afrocentrists and the conscious community assert that Islam is the usurper of native Africa. And they argue that it was a foreign, sort of a foreign pathogen that undermined the cultural and racial purity of Africa and African people. And according to them, the Muslims destroyed and occupied native Egypt, completely undermined indigenous African culture wherever they went, that the Arabs were the first to exploit Africans, and the Arab slave trade was equal, if not worse, than the transatlantic slave trade, making Islam just as culpable in the destruction of African civilization. And as we've been talking about, we, that is completely false. It is beyond an exaggeration. It's found nowhere in the literature. It's not anywhere in the literature that would justify it. It is a byproduct of leaning on these Orientalist, anti-Muslim sources that were created or written to justify the subjugation of Muslim land in which Islam was the primary opponent against. They did it. The the Orientalists got Islam wrong, and so Afrocentrists who borrow from Orientalism are getting Islam wrong. And to add to that, in terms of more ways that Afrocentrists reinforce European Eurocentric thought, it comes from even cartography, uh, to quote uh, Ali Muzari, he says that a European decision to make Africa end at the Red Sea has decisively de-Africanized the Arabian Peninsula. The tyranny of the sea is in part a tyranny of European geographical prejudices. Just as European map makers could decree that on the map Europe was above Africa instead of below, an arbitrary decision in relation to the cosmos, those map makers could also dictate that Africa ended at the Red Sea instead of the Persian Gulf, end quote. And so even the very notion that Arabia is outside of Africa is in and of itself a product of Eurocentric cartography. And so even that, that's just another way on, you know, from a, a epistemological perspective that Afrocentrists are reinforcing European thought. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that? Well, I like what he, what Masri said is that uh, the idea of making Europe north up superior, Africa south, down down below sub even the word sub-Saharan the word any the word sub implies subpar, right? That this is a completely arbitrary uh, demarcation in relationship to the cosmos because there is no up and down, left and right. These things are arbitrarily decided, and they're decided. Uh, look, maps are inherently political. 
always have been. Maps have always been political. They've always reflected the politics uh, of the people who are making the maps, okay? Uh, and so the decision to exclude the uh, entire, the entire uh, Arabian Peninsula from the rest of Africa, when the same rocks and trees that are on one side of the Red Sea are on the exact immediate other side of the Red Sea, when the languages that are spoken on one side of the Red Sea are phonetically similar to the languages immediately on the other side of the Red Sea, when the phenotype of the people on one side of the Red Sea are very similar to the phenotype of the people on the other side of the Red Sea. So the decision to exclude the Arabian Peninsula entirely from the continent of Africa, from the historical, cultural, uh, geographical, and genetic context of Africa, is as should be by Afrocentrist standards, just as problematic as excluding Egypt from the rest of Africa. Mm. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, but, but see, the problem with Afrocentrism is it's not a real discipline. It never became a, a discipline with theory, uh, criteria, and methodology. It's sort of uh, grasped in the dark or in very dim light to pick up whatever it could, whatever it, it, it could use as a tool to sort of fashion a, uh, a, 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 a view or perspective on history that undermined and offset the extremely biased uh, view of the uh, white established academic view of history. And that's fine, but then it never progressed beyond that. In fact, it devolved into what today we have, the conscious community. They have no – listen, the debate that many of us in the Muslim community had with people like John Henry Clark, Ben Yochanan, Chancellor Williams, um, was a debate on historiography. It was a debate on sources. So this conversation that we're having about the Orientalist uh, influence on Afrocentrist writing, that is a debate about historiography. The conscious community today, they don't use sources. They're not even pretending to have a scholarly approach to a subject. The, this is the Internet generation when you talk about the conscious community. The conscious community, you're talking about memes, social media, you know, message forums, threads, all of that stuff. But you're not talking about an act, an actual discipline, where an actual discipline where uh, ideas are part of a framework which is activating or or operating within a theory. It is purely political. Purely political. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it's like they talk about the, they talk about the spread of Islam through the sword, and they talk about the Arab slave trade. And there's no timeline for any of this stuff. And oftentimes, the things that they're saying happen are chronologically out of order. And based on when they did actually happen, it's impossible for them to have happened the way in which they're saying they did. Absolutely. And I think what, one of the essential, like, if you just, like, take a step backwards, one of the essential aims of why the Afrocentric movement came out with this need to address this white supremacist framing of history that denied black people contributions to the world and agency in this world, this white supremacist worldview that said black people were nothing, we never contributed anything to world civilization, black people were just swinging from trees in Africa with bones in our noses before Europeans came to civilize this. Afrocentrism was intended to correct that narrative, yet anti-Islamic manifestations of Afrocentrism fail at its very purpose in achieving that aim for the very reasons that have been listed. They, in the same way that Europeans told this lie that Africans were just swinging from trees before they came to colonize us, they're reinforcing this white man's lie that all Muslims were doing was, you know, spreading Islam through the sword. In the same way that Europeans decided to have their own cartography and their own create their own maps for their own political purposes. Afrocentrism uses that same logic 
to demarcate Arabia from Africa. And so they, they, they fail Afrocentrism, especially anti-Islamic manifestations of Afrocentrism, have failed at its very purpose. And it's an ideology that I would say is reactionary. It's, it's a reactionary attempt to address white supremacy, but it fails at that very goal. Well, yeah, uh, Afro, uh, there's a sliding scale of racial supremacy in which Europeans were at the top, and then you had, Af- you had black folk at the very bottom, and then you had everyone else in between in, prox- in, higher, in greater approximation or, or proximity to the Europeans. And the darker you were, the closer you were to us. The lighter you were, the closer you were to those on top. And so the Arabs were afforded this kind of what you would call noble savage um, status, which though they were inferior to Europeans in the eyes of Europeans, they were slightly superior to uh, Africans. And so part of that reactionary uh, uh, writing on the part of Afrocentrists is an attempt to sort of offset that, but it is, it is done without having the right tools to do it, the proper analysis to be able to parse, okay, this is what, Afro, this is what Eurocentrists are, this is how they're looking at this subject of race, Africans and Arabs, black and brown. This is what is actually going on with regard to these events, the slave trade and the spread, of, the Arab slave trade and the spread of Islam in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is the actual relationship or the, 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 um, the relationship between Islam and indigenous Africa, because that's something else they don't really have a grasp on, which is what the relationship was between indigenous African societies and the religion of Islam, okay? And the fact of the matter is is that the religion of Islam was indigenized, thoroughly indigenized. African cultures were Islamized, but Islam was indigenized. So African cultures were Islamized. And Islam was, I don't want to say Africanized, but it was, it was, it was situated, it was assimilated within the African milieu, if you will. Um, and one of the reasons, and there are different examples of how Islam in Africa, in Sub-Saharan, what we call Sub-Saharan Africa, was notably distinct from Islam in the rest of the Muslim world, even immediately to the north. Um, among the Berbers. There was a distinct sub-Saharan West African society or culture that was the product of an enterprise of native West Africans. So this, is, this, is, this brings to light a, another point about Arabs in Africa. Arabs did not force Islam on indigenous Africans and then stand over them and make sure they were practicing it properly. Africans voluntarily adopted Islam and then owned and operated how it functioned within African society. It was a completely indigenous affair. Mm -hmm. Completely indigenous affair. There is nowhere where the Arabs... um, I said that the Arabs ceased being a dominant political force in the late 7th century. And then the very people that they subjugated ended up breaking free and, in some cases, subjugating them. Um, Well, Sub-Saharan West African, well, this was only taking place in the North and in the Middle East. Sub-Saharan Africans were never subjugated by Arabs. So when they adopted Islam, it was... The, 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 the function and operate, it was an indigenous enterprise through and through. And I, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, you know, you can even res, uh, resort, uh, resort to um, Sheikh Anta Jope's book, Pre-Colonial Black Africa, um, where he, you know, goes into detail about this. But, you know, Afrocentrists for the longest 
would assert that uh, Ghana, Ghana, by way of conquest by a federation of Berbers who established an empire in Morocco, Algeria, and Spain in the 11th century, known as the Almoravids, okay? They were saying that these Almoravids introduced Islam into Ghana by force when they conquered Ghana and Ghana fell. I've heard Clark mention the Omahads and the Almoravids before, okay? Well, here's the thing. Right, this event that supposedly took place in the 11th century, in which Islam was forced on sub-Saharan, on, on, and in which Islam was forced on the people of Ghana uh, in the 11th century by Arabs, this event does not appear anywhere in the literature of that era. I actually read about that, and I read that it was a complete uh, fabrication. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not in West African traditions or in secondary sources past a certain point. We know people were in the habit of narrating their conquests. So it is beyond suspicion that we can't find it mentioned. And in an article entitled The Conquest That Never Was by uh, David Conrad and Humphrey Fisher, which appeared in um, what's called The History of Africa, uh, they write about this controversy on page 53. And they say on page 53, uh, quote, in part one of this paper, they're, they're talking about uh, their uh, discussion of this supposed Arab conquest of Ghana. They said, in part one of this paper, we examined the external written sources and found no unambiguous evidence that an Almoravid conquest of ancient Ghana ever occurred. The local oral evidence reviewed in this part of our study supports our earlier hypothesis in that we find nothing in the traditions to indicate any conquest of the 11th century Sahelian state known to Arab geographers as, quote, Ghana. Indeed, the oral traditions emphasize drought as having had much to do with the eventual disintegration of the Sonaki state known locally as Wagadu. So this, you know, they're smoking gun, which is how Islam eventually enters into, how, how it initially enters into sub-Saharan West Africa, uh, is false. We know there, as I said earlier, there was an attempt on the part of Muslims who went into Egypt by force, but that was only to confront the Romans. But then they tried to push southward. But we know there that they were defeated. So where, where did they enter in through force? Yeah. Well, and actually, you, you, don't want to, you know what I mean? I mean, the way, the way that Islam enters into the Sahel and sub-Saharan West Africa is by Arab and African merchants try, carrying out commerce across the Sahara Desert. And from these African merchants, kings, and leaders of tribes embraced Islam and their subjects then followed. Sheikh Antajot described this process as auto-imitation in pre-colonial black Africa, where he says that African conversion to Islam was a top-down process where the African elites, royalty and aristocrats, converted to the religion, giving it a regal status, and that was then adopted by the rest of the village. So the religion was indigenized to meet the needs of the specific lineage group that converted. Force was never the primary process by which Islam enters and settles in sub-Saharan Africa. African sovereignty was intact during the spread of Islam, and this is the main reason that the religion was so rapidly and easily indigenized. 